Hi, Rudy. Hi. So, have you read this book, Spiritual Anatomy? Yes, I love it. Oh, okay. Good, good. Uh, I'm happy. I received it um, with the with the uh, opportunity to provide the endorsement, and um, you know, I think it's very, very important for today for people to receive this type of information. Thank you for being that that shining light. It brings a lot many people joy. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Can you um, tell me more about spiritual anatomy and you know what was the initial? Impetus to, to write the book. What was the first spark that drove you to write this amazing book? Well, the interest came slowly and slowly. I mean, over the years, what I had experienced, I had maintained uh, now and then my small writings. Uh, all also most of it had been stored here, and I've a lot of books are written on yoga and chakras. And uh, the historical development or the actual development of the yoga in India got stuck only with seven chakras. There was no further advancement uh, in understanding the entire yoga chakra system. And people got stuck with the Sahasra Dal Kamal. I don't know if you're familiar or heard of it. It's a center which, if you combine, uh, this t top of the ear lobes and go up like this. Here is the thousand petal lotus they talk about. And they mm -hmm. consider it to be the highest. And they also talk about Sat Chit Anand, means a blissful state. Right, right. right? And uh, my guru, my master used to say it is the Sat Chit Anand. The kind of consciousness is like a toy in the hands of a yogi, and he should stop playing with these toys and go beyond it. <laughs> and um, that, and he also helped us experience stages beyond it in a very uh, in a black and white. You can perceive them, see, as you advance. And so that was one of the reasons that how consciousness change as we. Um, attain greater heights in understanding and um, greater heights, not just in understanding, but having attained the greater heights, meaning as we move from lower chakras to the higher chakras, what happens to our consciousness? So, to my experience, there are five chakras within this uh, one square foot of area here. So one chakra is almost three fingers below our left nipple. Its mirror image is here, and you flip the mirror image here, and then here. So total five chakras in this area. And they all play with dualities, opposite qualities, like peace versus restlessness, mm -hmm. fear versus courage, love versus anger, and things like that. And if you if you recollect your medical college days, uh, there was a term called nun's disease that was prevalent mm -hmm. in uh, you know around 14th, 15th century, and that's when the, this word was coined, diagnostic nun's disease, because most nuns those days used to develop a, a kind of a cancer tumors in the left breast. Mm -hmm. And one wonders why only the left breast. So, And that reinforced my understanding also that around the left breast here, this area, it's controlled, is regulated by our emotions. Mm -hmm. Suppressed mm -hmm. emotions or yeah. overexpressed emotions. So these are dualities that are played out here. And the play of dualities that keeps us bound and doesn't give you a sense of liberation. Once we are transcending these five chakras, you are literally eligible. So you can say you are in a zone of liberation. You feel free because now you are no longer... Um, 
playing with dualities like likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental thing we all uh, are preoccupied with. Even when you are sitting in a plane, likes and dislikes go through your mind. Oh, this person, yeah. this person carrying too much baggage and I don't like that. Air hostess, she is good. She is serving better. Uh, when we are watching TV, oh, I like to have that house or I like to, I don't like that, uh, what is being advertised. So our mind is always on likes and dislikes. Yes. And they are played out with these dualities. And once we transcend these dualities, means you understand life better where you are no longer busy with likes and dislikes, but you transcend that with right understanding. Then you go above here and a lot of energies become available to you, a lot of power. And people are crazy for power. But a yogi has to keep on moving. He cannot get stuck on one chakra. Mm -hmm. So what I have written here is, it's all about personal experience and how our consciousness keeps changing. Going beyond here, this is the play of dualities, but going beyond these chakras, where one feels, when we worship, there is an object of worship and myself. And lesser and lesser of myself, lesser and le lesser identification with my stuff. Mm -hmm. I now identify more and more with the beloved, the object of worship. Right? So we slowly come near this SDK or Sahasrudal Kamal. And such individuals who have really uh, reduced our identification with the self and identify with the higher, some joy automatically just emanates from within. And then going further beyond, where no efforts are required. So far, there were efforts. Afterward, there are no efforts. Most people get stuck and no research, no research is actually took place uh, beyond this chakra because the bliss that one experience, experiences is so overwhelming and uh, you don't feel like moving out of it. So that is the main reason why people could not go beyond it. But, but that and, must be some other... Uh, 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 attachment to becomes it, it, that bliss itself can make it becomes sticky. Yeah, it it you are jailed in uh, with the bliss. You are so much locked yeah. down by the bliss, uh, and you are not able to go further in your consciousness with you. So no. that's why my master used to say that it is like a, a worm relishing the cow dung. <laughs> 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 so there is no no difference between a yogi who is relishing this consciousness and the cow and the worm in a cow tongue. They are similar in nature. So one so, has to go beyond. Yeah, it's, it's release from the attachment to even bliss. Yeah. Even the bliss that comes with higher consciousness can be a, a prison. Yeah. And uh, anytime we anytime we indulge in sticky things. In the lower chakras, the stickiness comes from the need for retaliation, uh, being upset, you know, like and dislike, judgment. And then you, you keep climbing the chakras, but there's always something to like. And as, as long as there's something to like or desire, uh, you're not free. You're stuck. <laughs> yeah. And so he, I, I would like to share another thing uh, that I learned from him was his statement, so pure and simple, he said, look, children play, they play with toys. They enjoy playing with toys. And as you grow up, as teenagers, you're busy with romancing, right? Then later on, if you happen to become a yogi, you begin to enjoy consciousness. It is still a toy in your hand. Mm -hmm. Try to go beyond consciousness and find what supports this consciousness. 
Exactly. And this is, I would, consciousness is trapped in time and space. But pure awareness is not. Pure awareness is what we say, non-local. So we can talk about higher and higher consciousness, but I, I and this is something where Deepak and I have, have uh, debated a little bit about the terms. But for me, awareness is different than consciousness. Mm. The pure awareness is existence. It's 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 all it's everything. Existence and awareness is doesn't need time or space. When awareness or pure awareness becomes aware, it can only be aware of itself. And now it has to, that has to happen somewhere, space, sometime. And now we create consciousness. And to me, escaping even the highest consciousness into pure awareness means you've escaped the confines of space and time in your existence. I know this sounds very abstract, but, you know, many folks think when they meditate and they reach that bliss that now they've they've escaped the highest consciousness into pure awareness. But mm. in pure awareness, it's, it's a-causal. There's no desire. There's no fear. There's, uh, yeah. there's just, it's just is. <laughs> just is, yes. And, uh, yeah. How you get there, you know, um, well, we're not going to get there with science. <laughs> so. <laughs> and to measure the states, the various levels of consciousness, uh, I don't think there are gadgets uh, developed uh, to measure the finest level of consciousness. No. Something that is everywhere. I, I'll share with you one real life experience. Once, you know, I'm a pharmacist by practice, private profession. And I ran many drugstores in New York City and New Jersey. And uh, my passion those days in 2003s and 2004 was to open as many drug stores as possible, say, independent drug stores. So I was always on the lookout. One of my managers, um, she took me to a grocery store, which was out for sale, good size store, and right in front of a hospital. I said, well, I, it's a wonderful place. I must open a drug store here because then you don't have to do any marketing. <laughs> then I, the grocery store owner was there at that time. And I, those days I used to smoke also. So I, just for a courtesy, I bought my, my Marlboro light and started smoking. And then next thing I said, oh my God, I have to use the restroom. So he, the owner led me to his office, to his, uh, restroom. I just could not use the rest. The moment I get inside, there was so much of uh, dark energy, dark force, uh, just overimposing. And then I, I couldn't use it. I couldn't ease myself and I just came out. And then later on, I asked the manager, who came with me. Can you find out what is happening there? So she called up the owner. And owner says, just last, why he is selling the uh, grocery store? But there was a robbery at that place. Mm -hmm. And in that robbery, one of his relatives, the cashier, was killed in that restroom. Some He was shot in the head. Oh, man. Yeah. So uh, oh. now... Uh, Many people, this, now my question was then and even now, how is it that memory gets stored in space? Hmm. Something that happened in that location remains there in the form of vibrations or whatever we call it. Uh, and that, that field is there with certain impressions. And a person perceives those impressions, and depending on the nature of those impressions, you translate that in your mind, in your heart, maybe as love, maybe as fear. And if I had even better accurate consciousness, then I should have been able to see what had actually happened without asking that person. 
because there are there are yogis and history um, that people feel what has happened in this place 5000 years back or even yesterday there are some yogis who can say all these things so when we so, talk of consciousness uh, it's always there there is no question of past present or the future exactly. it is static in pure awareness there is no time or space and and everything has happened every every, every possible thing is yeah, has yeah. or is everything that will or has is it's all at once in, in pure awareness every every possibility is already there and it, it, it's you know even a quantum explanation for probability waves that have to collapse to create reality you can say quantum yeah. you look at yeah, it yeah. but if you analyze in pure awareness there's no time or space so if you are able in a mindful way to clear your mind so much of what your brain brings you the sensations the imagination the feelings the thoughts and escape that local consciousness of time and space to tap in for just one second that intuition into pure awareness free of time and space you can experience things that already happen because they're, they're, they're everything's already there in pure awareness i mean I, even quantum physics would tell you time and space is an illusion of our consciousness taking probability waves and and collapsing them to our reality our reality is a species specific based on our genetics and our 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 uh, 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 sensory systems right every our world's different than a bacterial world they're all valid right each universe is valid bacteria's universe our universe it's all species specific but as probabilities collapse we create our reality you escape that when you escape that you escape the consciousness your brain is uh, tapping into you tap into pure awareness and now you can tap into non-local events that are free of the time and space you're in now and i think that's what that intuition was you had you were intuiting in pure awareness free of time and space and consciousness and event because of your own evolution as uh, your own of your own soul you know yes. uh being evolving to reach those states more readily than you know that, that takes some time and I, I guess that's that drove you to be where you are and what you're writing about today. Yeah. You know, this, uh, uh, another, <laughs> and the beauty of this heartfulness way of meditation, right, it transcends space and time. Right. For, for example, uh, you are in the United States. I am in India. I can close my eyes, you can close your eyes, and I can help you experience the transmission, the pranahuti. Right? So it is transcending the space. But if I tell you that I'm going to work now on you at this moment, but you can sit on your own tomorrow evening i work on you now but you will feel it tomorrow evening something something like that or you might say kamlesh can you give me a meditation session i say okay why don't you sit now and rudy says no i don't have time fine tell me when you can meditate so you'll say okay i can meditate as soon as i reach home at 6 p.m my job is as soon as I have time, which is not syncing with your 6 p.m., I can sit here and say, whenever Rudy sits at home at 6 p.m., he will receive the sitting. Or you promised that you would sit at 6 o'clock, but then you forgot, and then you remembered it at 9 o'clock. And you say, okay, let's try me, let me try it out, let me sit at 9 o'clock that meditation session will still work on you because I have done my part. Mm -hmm. I have already given you the meditation session. It's up to you when you meditate because the, the what we call sankalpa in Sanskrit means it's a prayerful suggestion for things to happen. When I met Deepak Chopra, oh, when, okay. we first, when we first uh, spoke together, at a TED Med 
in at the Hotel Del Coronado uh, back in 2010. And and after we after we spoke in our sessions, it also included Quincy Jones and Frank Gehry, who was on aging, aging gracefully. Um, we literally, we're in the restroom in Deepak, who I didn't know at the time. I knew one of them. Turned to me and said, I, I enjoyed your presentation. Tell me, is the brain a noun or a verb? And so <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And I said, it's a verb, but maybe we should talk outside. <laughs> you know, the rest yes, of it. Yes. And that led to uh, us writing our three books together, Super Brain and Super Genes and The Healing Self, which is the other side of what I do, which is the more um, day-to-day self-care, the role of spirituality, the importance of mind, body, spirit uh, connection to keep yourself in a healing state rather than a destructive state. Lovely, lovely. I just received that book. I'm yet to go through it. Someone from US has sent me that book. And uh, as I say, I was, I'm just about to start and I'm glad I met you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes, yes. Was that, was that the healing self or the or super brain or, or the, the genes the... and super brain or genes and uh, it's something to do with genetics, what you where you have written along with uh, Deepak Chopra. Yeah, the genetics ones was the genetic one was super genes. That was the second. The I first see. one was super brain, and the one that I use now in my work in the. Uh, McCann Center for Brain Health, where we offer help for people in keeping their brains healthy, promoting brain health, is the last book, The Healing Self, had an action plan at the end about how to live your life to keep your brain healthy, uh, emphasizing um, basically lifestyle and spirituality. And that's the one we use in the center uh, for brain health that I direct here at uh, Mass General Hospital. And uh, it, and it gave rise to an acronym I use for brain health uh, mm. of shield uh, to <laughs> take care of your shield is you know to sleep handling stress interaction with others exercise learning new things and indeed diet. Yes, yeah. sleep is the most important of all. Sleep enough sleep <laughs> and timely sleep because if we follow the circadian rhythm and allow this cerebrospinal fluid to do its job, you know, to flow it during sleep from the brain cells. Yeah, you know, so, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. We didn't really know that in the neuroscience world until recently. We never knew the brain had a lymphatic system until... <laughs> very special until, one. <laughs> yes, but we didn't know. That we always believed up until 10 to 15 years ago, that the brain didn't have a lymphatic system. But it turns out that, <laughs> that at night when you sleep, this is when you wash out debris from the brain and you also break down debris. And with regard to Alzheimer's, the debris that we call amyloid or beta amyloid is what gets broken down right after you mm -hmm. dream and mm -hmm. go into deep sleep. You break down the amyloid that was made all day in the brain and then you clear it from the brain. So I like to say when you sleep, it's kind of like every time you dream and go into deep sleep, it's like a rinse cycle for the brain. You're rinsing yes. the brain. And I, I think the method we offer in the heartfulness way of meditation, the cleaning aspect, it does tremendously in uh, reducing the inflammation inside. So increasing the space within the brain brain cells, inter intercellular space to expand because the inflammation is less. Um, because, you know, the brain can't afford to have unnecessary lymphatic system. I mean, it's it takes too much of space. The real estate is very limited. So it has to develop a different method without involving the lymphatic system. It has its, so it created its own system. And yeah, yeah. Certain, certain enzymes can be, I think, slowed down because of this rejuvenation process we offer. And we meditate in the morning, especially with an attention towards the heart, and we get immersed in that meditation. 
And uh, our job as meditator is just close your eyes, and that's all. Rest of the work is done uh, through the <clears throat> receptors we call trainers. And um, if you believe in things like initiation, it is not a ritualistic initiation, but there is a process involved where person, meditator and a trainer, they sit together and prepare our consciousness in such a way that whenever we meditate, we automatically receive the transmission or grace from above. And that helps us dive deeper into ourselves. And this can be measured. This can be measured with the EEG. I mean, mm -hmm. within a few seconds, you will see a shift in EEG. few seconds. Yeah. 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 And you go I from like alpha, beta to... down to theta. And immediately, slow down. Yeah, yeah, immediately it will do. And uh, we can do a lot of comparative studies of various meditative systems and uh, say that this is good and this is just hoax. We can, we'll be able to do a biggest service in the world by, you know, removing a lot of systems which are just being marketed for the sake of money, but they, that actually doesn't do anything. They act like placebo. But, well, you know, let me, so just unpacking some of the things you said, which I totally agree. And I really um, fascinated by all of your insight here, because as a neuroscientist, it's right on, right on track. Um, first of all, in the brain, there are different ways to clean out debris. So the brain is like a city and people are bringing out their trash and you have to take out the trash. And what slows down the brain as we get older is that trash builds up and eventually the brain cells respond to that with inflammation. At the end of the day, it's inflammation that causes the most damage. The question is, how do you trigger inflammation? And in the brain, it's not taking out the garbage. So there are many ways for the brain. So you have to think about how much garbage you make and how well do you take it out? Well, how well we take it out, like you said, sleep. During sleep, we actually trigger cells in the brain called microglia. Microglia, yes. They eat, they eat the trash. Yes, the glial cells. Also, yeah, you also trigger what's called the glymph, glymphatic system, mm -hmm. where another cell called the astrocyte releases enzymes that break down the trash. And the third thing is literally the brain constricts to wash away this trash through the lymphatic system mm. that if you don't take out the trash well enough or if you make too much trash, that lymphatic flow gets blocked. So this is where we get to meditation. Meditation gets us to how to stop making trash. Yeah, like <laughs> Because what people don't realize is that there's a circuit in the brain and this is relatively new information about Alzheimer's and trash in the brain versus meditation. There's a circuit in the brain called the default mode network mm. where it's where it, it, it circles around the brain like this. And it's the network it fires to make you who you are ego wise. Like if, if this network wasn't firing, my face wouldn't look like this. It would look like my face looks like when I'm in deep sleep. When you're in deep sleep, you look totally different, right? Your, mm -hmm. None of your muscles are making your face the way you've made it. And so it maintains, so the default mode network is on whenever you're just not task driven or mindful. So let's mm -hmm. say you're, you're just gazing at someone judging them or saying, I don't like this. I don't like that. Or you're obsessing about the past. I wish I didn't do that. You're anxious about the future. Anytime you're not in the moment, mindful of your surroundings, self-aware, the default mode network is just like a generator. This is where the most trash is made. Yes. The more your default mode network is on, where you're not being mindful or in the moment, you're obsessing about the past, you're anxious about the future, you're judging others, you're saying my way or the highway, you're set in your way, you're not flexible, you make trash. So as we get older, we make more trash because we become more, we become more set in our way. And when you're young, you're more open-minded, you're aware, you're in the moment, you have the wow moments. And the wow moments of youth become the so what moments 
as you get older. <laughs> so what? Yeah, like and that. we call it, yeah, like, ah, so what? Been there, done that. So we call this <laughs> the, the, the twinkle to wrinkle syndrome. In the beginning, the twinkle in the eye, and at the end, it's the wrinkle. Yeah, whatever, right? So twinkle to wrinkle. So, this is what causes the trash. So you have to think about both things. Make less trash by being more mindful, meditating, and then get enough sleep and exercise does this too to take the trash out. And that's bottom line of how you keep the brain healthy. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen over the years of practice, I've been practicing since 1976 meditation. And what I have observed that my thinking is very precise. Understanding is very accurate also. Mm -hmm. So, correct thinking and right understanding, I think, in, <clears throat> are two vehicles, I think, where we can reduce the buildup of toxins in our brain. Okay? And also something that is through the heart, where you are sincere enough, you are honest enough with your attitudes, then too you don't build up all this waste in our system. Yes. And and continuously keep on introspecting. At night time, we have another process where we introspect ourselves and uh, see if we did anything uh, extraordinary. And we reflect on it and say, okay, let I can do better. Or <clears throat> if I made a mistake, then I can resolve not to repeat the same again. So, again, reducing the load of toxins day by day. And a time comes that you don't even build any toxins because your thinking is right, your feeling is right, your understanding is right. Then I think there is a zero waste. Of course, there will be some amount of... Uh, uh, toxins or waste created because of physiological processes involved in our, with our activities, day-to-day -day activities. But as far as attitudes are concerned, where you mentioned two fundamental things, likes and dislikes, that is judgmental nature. right? Mm -hmm. And you also clearly uh, put out this idea of prejudice. Uh, these are prejudice, prejudice, judgment, and as you get older, for purposes of subconscious need for security, being in, inflexible, thinking You're it's only my, <laughs> yeah, it's only it's, it's only my way. You're hardwired, and the hardwiring is what causes the problem. So yeah. you need, to, you know, in a Taoist way, be the be the, the flexible read, uh -huh. be open, don't judge, you know, be aware in the moment, and this leads to less stress. And stress, of course, kills nerve cells and causes inflammation. But also when you're open, um, and this means opening your heart, which opens the mind, yes. you are also going to learn more. And if you learn more things, you make more synapses. So we only have, we have 100 billion nerve cells, trillions of synapses, and they're being changed all the time. Neuroplasticity. This is what Deepak Chopra and I wrote about in Supergram. Well, as we get older, those synapses start to die and go away because of the buildup of waste, the stress, and also the and the inflammation that's being driven in the brain. Uh -huh. So, when you're open and your heart is open, you're going to interact more with people. You're going to talk about things that matter, where you're learning new things, and this is going to build up what we call your synaptic reserve. And as you get older, the more synapses you make, the more you can lose before you lose it. And the other, the, you know, just one more thing that you triggered when in, in which you just said is that the heart, well, our brain is evolving toward love and service. The, the original reptile brain, the instinctive brain, Yes, uh, and four, right. <laughs> yeah, four hundred million years old is just fight or flight, food and reproduce, right? And it's in, in its in its instinctive memory. There's no need you, you don't need to experience anything for those memories to drive you. And the limbic system here, which is you know maybe around hundred million years old, 
is where you have the first memories. Memory of pleasure creates desire and conditions you. Memory of pain creates fear and conditions you. And these are the first memories you have at, when you're born, is memories of what you like and what you don't like. And then finally, the frontal cortex says, hey, don't let that desire become an addiction. Don't let that fear become a phobia. And that's the logical intellectual brain. It, it's only about 50 million years old. But the newest, part, the newest part of the brain in the same area up front is giving us empathy and altruism. I see. It's, it's connecting the brain to the heart. So the current evolution of the brain is moving toward self-awareness, awareness of your self as part of a greater community, and, and empathy and altruism for others. And this is, is, if you're in line with the evolution of the brain, the brain will, you'll, you'll have more mental vitality and you'll have more happiness. It's, it's that simple. So love and service is the key. I love this one. I have learned so many things in just a few minutes, uh, Rudy. And the biggest thing, biggest take at the moment is the evolving brain, continuously evolving brain. And brain is no more a noun, it's a verb. And synaptic reserve. The, these things are new for me. And I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, basically, we're moving, the brain is moving from selfishness, selfishness, mm. and the brainstem to self-awareness mm. in the more advanced parts of the brain. And self-awareness means being mindful of self and knowing that you are not your brain. Uh. You are not you're not the experience your brain brings you, you know, it goes back to being the witness, the observer. And, you know, mountaintop consciousness, you know, that you're sitting on the mountaintop saying, what is my brain bringing me now? And I don't identify with it, I observe it. And then that, that also keeps the brain in a healthier state because it, it reduces the amount of self-indulgence, obsessiveness, frustration, anxiety that can come with advanced age as we become more, less secure with our own brain and body within our world. So I, this, all the scientific facts which are evolving now and we are, we are understanding the scientific perspective of positive thinking, avoiding uh, pessimism, etc. 10,000 years back, almost 10,000 years, maybe 12, there was a communication between two sages. One was a king, another was a sage. And the king asks the sage that, what's the best way for emancipation? How to be truly happy? And there are other questions. The first dialogue starts with a question. And the sage answered, reduce your desires. More and more of less and less of desires. And second thing he said, embrace five qualities. One is kshama, means to forgive. Another is daya, that is compassion. Another is arjava, that means it, to be sincere in what you are doing. Another is santosham, means contentment. And the final one, satya, being truthful. When we see this, and this, the whole book is about the entire exchange between the king and the sage is all about how to improve my consciousness. And it starts with these five qualities. And when we combine this with the scientific approach, that they are helping us reducing the formation of the waste, and helping us remove the toxins. When Absolutely. Yes, because the default, I mentioned the default mode network where you make the most toxins. Yeah. And in particular, the waste product that leads to Alzheimer's disease. The mm -hmm. amyloid, the, what's called beta amyloid. We all make it all the time. But we, it's plumbing. You make something, you make it, you get rid of it. You get rid of it when you sleep. You get rid of it with a healthy plant-based diet. Uh, we've shown all this scientifically, so I'm not just making, I mean, this is really science-based. When you sleep, you, you scrub it away. When you exercise, you enzymatically degrade it. Um, we, we just published the actual mechanism from the muscle, wow. 
when you exercise, releasing a hormone that goes into the brain, binds a certain cell, it gets it to release an enzyme, and it breaks down the, the, the trash, the amyloid. We showed the entire mechanism, or even down to the receptor and nucleo events that happen for that. But, but at the end of the day, you know, it's mindset. You know, you've got to turn off, you have to turn off that default mode network to get stronger and more hardwired with age. Mm. And it is driven by what exactly what you just said, um, being conditioned subconsciously by the desires and fears that you developed your whole life based on memories of pleasure and memories of pain, respectively. Mm -hmm. yeah. More and more of more and more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think I think that you know uh, love and service is such an amazing recipe. I, you know, I remember uh, you know in, in, in baseball in 2004 in my hometown of Boston, the mm. Boston Red Sox won the World Series and they had to come back from a three to nothing deficit to get into the World Series. Never been done before. Mm. And I talked to the batting coach, wonderful man Ron Jackson. They called him Papa Jack. Mm. I said, "What was the key? How did this team?" make history coming back from such a deficit to win the championship. He said, it's very simple. When the player got out to the plate, to bat, in his mind, we had him think not, how well am I going to do? I have to do well. I have to impress the fans, right? Instead, he only thought about, how do I serve my team? How do I get my friend on first base to second base? There's two outs. How do I make sure the man who's going to bat next gets up because I need to get a hit? How do I serve others? So now the pressure is off of you to perform and to impress. Now the heart is open. It just says, how do I serve? I want to take care of these guys. I love these guys. <laughs> and that was it. And it's Lovely. the case. I mean, even in music, you know, when you go play, when you play music with others, mm. the best jam session is when each musician is trying to make the other musicians sound better, not trying to impress them. It's lovely you know? examples, yes. Yeah. And yeah. I have heard also, and we made a video out of it with Phil Jackson. You know about the yes. Bulls, sure. Chicago Bulls, and they were the losing uh, team until Phil Jackson came in as a coach. And ever since he started coaching Bulls, and they had a winning streak for almost four or five years. Yeah. And the moment he leaves uh, Chicago Bulls and joins LA Lakers, and then right. the winning streak starts there. And when you, when you ask him, what is the reason? He says, I teach them meditation. They all meditate before they even begin to practice. And there must be meditation before the match. Just for five to ten minutes of meditation, that's all. This yeah. is the only thing he says I have done differently than most coaches. So that yeah. that self awareness and uh, and uh, sharing attitude that my team matters, not myself. Compassion, like you said. Compassion. Compassion. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I like the the five you mentioned. You know, forgiveness, not letting go of your team member making a mistake, contentment with the situation. Yeah. And the compassion. These, these, this is these are. That's beautiful. What you, I, I learned something there. I have to. Remember, I remember those five. <laughs> may I, May I request you one more one thing actually from you? Mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to. Uh, there is this lecture series by Great Courses. Uh, the title is like that: The Great Courses on, on Audible uh, mm -hmm. book releases. And this was on consciousness by Dr. Jordan, uh, Steve Jordan from Toronto University. And he talks on, of consciousness and memory both. Uh, there he came across, he made a statement that we have the, the various centers functioning, optical nerve, optical center, olfactory, all those auditory. We have also have recognized the thinking part of the brain. But so far, we are, we are failing in identifying the center for intuition. For intuition. Intuition. Yeah. I think that comes from clearing the mind of too much judgment, preconceived notions, 
conditioning, you know, just letting that the mind just be open again. And that begins with the heart. The heart opens the mind. Because if your intention is to serve others, not impress people with how great a scientist you are, but to serve science, this opens up, this opens you up to intuition. Now, now I agree with the fellow you were talking about. We don't know the exact part of the brain that brings intuition, but I think it's it's more not just a part of the brain, but it's turning oh, off nice. turning off the other parts of the brain to block intuition and mm. open yourself up to that super conscious input. They, yeah. Yeah. So I one of these days I'm I may be traveling to US and then hopefully try and meet you along with some children. Uh, and these children, uh, Deepak must have told you that they can read with closed eyes. They can identify a person with closed eyes. Mm. And we begin the experiment like this, that when we keep our eyes closed, then the optic nerve doesn't, I mean, the center doesn't respond. So in fMRI, we'll be able to see that this person is not seeing or having his eyes opened. Right, so that is the first thing we we learn, and then second thing we do is we give them different objects or a paper, something to read with closed eyes, or identify a photograph or things like that. And during that process, see which part of the brain is involved in that activity. So it's not a big, I would say, time-consuming experiment. I think it can be. Uh, concluded in a day or two. Were these children, I would love to meet them and hear more about this, were these children trained to do this or they had a natural ability and were found? They the have been, they, we trained, we have trained more than 100,000 <laughs> children so far. Oh. And uh, Deepak had witnessed all these things. In fact, Deepak, uh, his, he was so mesmerized actually when <laughs> You know, when uh, he said, I'm going to uh, Ladakh, when uh, Deepak came here, he said, I'm going to Ladakh. And uh, <clears throat> he wanted to know what's happening in the place he's going to visit. So he gave the photograph, which is over his iPhone. He showed it to this child, child with his closed eyes, felt and told Deepak that this place has no more light, no more spiritual light. Then Deepak was shockingly surprised. He said, it is true because the master who used to live there passed on few months back. Oh, yeah, I, I, I know is, the master we're talking is, about, yes. This up, is even more the, advanced. The yeah, yeah, yeah. This is even more advanced. And some children, I mean, just reading with closed eyes or identifying the colors or identifying a person, things, these are all very, very interesting things. And my interest is more what really happens when they are intuiting from inside. This was wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you, Rudy. And you carry Thank on. You. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, let's stay in touch. We'd love to meditate again. I have had so many interviews, but not like this one. This has been most, I, I learned a lot from you. Thank you. Me, me too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.